Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Amen. It feels wonderful in here, being with men who want to hear from God. And I so appreciate, I want to give my welcome, so appreciate all of you that made the effort. I know some of you have driven and uh, traveled long distance, and I'm trusting that God is going to help you, and he's going to meet with us. We're in for a great uh, time tomorrow morning, outstanding preaching, and uh, so God is going to speak to us. I want to, uh, before I go into the Word of God, I just want to rejoice with you. Pastor Olson mentioned uh, my father in the vision that uh, he imparted and has blessed our fellowship. Uh, I just want to rejoice. Uh, something wonderful. Pastor Mitchell planted the first church in Tucson, Arizona. Planted Harold and Mona Warner in Tucson in 1973. We planted churches continually. That is multiplied. We still have four weeks to go in this year. There still are another four conferences to go. I have not received from all the pastors the, uh, uh, all of the uh, info on their church plants, but as of right now, tonight, December 3rd, we now stand at 3,021 churches around the world. And so, thank God. That is wonderful. Oh, God, what a privilege. And it is accelerating multiplying, hearing wonderful reports uh, everywhere I go and uh, where others are of what God is doing. So we continue to do right. We're in for a great time. Uh, I think uh, next year we have two brand new conferences uh, in McAllen and Toronto. So we will have, uh, off the top of my head, I think we have 52 conferences a year around the world, one a week we're having right now. And so we are doing damage to the enemy's domain. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Amen. Turn in your Bibles. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. If you were to Google the words fired for outburst, you don't have to do that. I did it for you. So don't do that right now. But if you were to Google those words, you would find uh, headlines such as highest producing sales agent fired for outburst in Costco. Senior prosecutor fired after courtroom outburst. Houston Astros executive fired after outburst towards reporter. Canadian rugby, uh, our national rugby coach was fired after Twitter outburst. And those are just a few on and on and on, they all have the common theme of people who altered their destiny. They altered their future in life because they had no ability to say no to themselves. They had no self-control in anger or their mouth or, or whatever it is, and it altered their, the course of their life. The scripture that we're going to read, a man named Adonijah, he changes his life and destiny because of his actions. But in our text, we're going to focus on a statement that, in paraphrasing, Adonijah had never heard the word no. I want to tell you as we begin in this men's rally, if you want to survive as a man, you want to survive. As a believer, as a man of God, if you want to succeed, you need to hear the word no. And I want to preach a message I've entitled, The Need for No. 1 Kings 1, starting at verse 5, we'll read through verse 10. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggit, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. Look at verse 6. This is our key verse. And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, why have you done so? And he was also uh, very good looking. His mother bore him after Absalom. Then he conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, 
and with Abiathar the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David, they were not with Adonijah. Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zoalet, which is by Enrogel. And he also invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the mighty man, or Solomon his brother. The need for no. Let's begin. I want to talk about Adonijah inside. Our text tells us something about this man, Adonijah. He had never heard the word no. Verse 6, his father had not rebuked him at any time, saying, why have you done so? In other words, his whole life, no one ever told him no. His desires had never been challenged. There never came a time where he felt like doing something, but he had to rein himself in. This is part of life training is to hear the word no. Children, I want to eat candy and junk. No, you're going to eat some vegetables. I want to hit my sister. I want to throw a fit. I want to pout. No, you're not going to act like that in this house. Listen, those are not just vegetable lessons. Those are not just family lessons. Those are life lessons because what you're learning when you hear no growing up is you learn I can't act any way that I feel I can't do whatever I want to never mind what it does to other people Adonijah never heard no so in our text now years later he has a personal desire that is not right. It is not the will of God. Verse 5, I will be king. The fact that it's not right and not the will of God, that doesn't even enter into his head because he's never heard no. The fact that it causes turmoil in other people's lives it doesn't factor into his thinking because he's never heard the word no. Think about this. One of the, the characteristics of babies or infancy is they lack self-control. Not only do they need diapers, you have to carry babies because they don't have the muscle control and coordination sometimes even to sit up, much less walk or run. If babies are healthy and normal in time, they will develop more and more self-control. That is a sign of maturity. If you're a baby and you have no self-control, that's fine. You're cute. <laughs> if you're a man and you, people are still carrying you, because you don't have the ability to control yourself, there's a problem. So Adonijah, ancient story, it's actually a picture of our flesh nature. Let me say, we all have some Adonijah inside of us. We're reading about a man who has been dead for thousands of years. Pastor Greg, who is Adonijah? Us. You, me, we have parts in our being that the Bible calls the flesh. There is a part of it that is unregenerate. Listen, some of you are dressed up. Some of you are holding Bibles. Some of you are saying amen. And yet, there is still a part of our being that we want to do wrong, we don't want to do right. Romans 7, 18, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Listen, gentlemen, it is dangerous in life to never hear the word no. Think about the people you work with. Think about people you are in ministry or 
people maybe even that you have in your family that cause the most turmoil. They say whatever pops into their head. They act exactly how they feel, even when it's appropriate. They cannot grasp the idea of consequences. And so they cause turmoil for everyone else. Many times, those are people growing up, they never heard no. It's dangerous to never say no to our flesh. Adonijah had no self-discipline. I want it. It's not right. It's not God's will. It causes turmoil. Don't care. I want it. And it's dangerous if you don't have the ability to say no to your flesh. Proverbs 25, 28. Those who do not control themselves are like a city whose walls are broken down. Great word picture here. God says people without self-control in their life, one of the marks is things are broken. Things don't work well when, they're, uh, uh, when, uh, when they don't have self-control. Relationships are broken. Finances are broken. Marriages are broken. Ministry is broken. Salvation is broken. The Bible says men with no self-control the mark of their life is things will be broken. And then it says there are no walls. They're at risk in ancient times. The defense of a city was walls. And it says men who lack self-control, they have no protection. The strategies of hell aimed at their life, they have no ability to defend themselves. Why? Because they can't say no to anything. They can't say no to themselves. They can't say no to their emotions. They can't say no to their desires. So when hell comes along, that's not the day they're going to start saying no. 1998, there was a, uh, a ferry ship left uh, uh, the port in Belgium the herald of free enterprise, a ferry, this type of uh, uh, ship has doors at both ends. You drive in one way, you drive to port, they let down the doors in the other end. They finished that leg and took off, and as they took off out of port, the unofficial policy was they would take off with the front doors still open. And it was a man's job to come close the doors once the ship is moving so the water can't get in. The problem was he was tired, so he was asleep when they took off. There was no one to close the doors. Water poured in. The ferry sank, and 188 people died. Why? The doors were open. The scripture that I just read says, men without self-control... The doors are open to hell at all times. They have no protection. So Adonijah had never heard the word no. The Bible says he had a, has a desire. He wants something. Can't say no to himself. But look at the strategy that someone without self-control follows to try and get what they want. Step one is personal desire. We want something. When we want something, we can work out reasons why. It's not that I want it. I need it. It's only right. There are you ever heard this one? I can't help it. You ever notice that the things when guys say, I can't help it, it's never for good things, right? Like, I just can't help it. I just was fasting and praying. Couldn't stop. No, that's not what they say. I couldn't help it on. It's always sin. It's always something stupid. I deserve it. I've been working hard. I've been hurt. 
It's not that I want this. No, no, no. I've been hurt. That's why I have to. I have to look after my future. You don't understand. It's not that I want it. It's, it's I'm actually thinking of the family. That's my only concern. Listen, if you want something bad enough, you'll find reasons. Especially if you never hear no. Your, your mind will go to work and you will ingeniously come up with reasons why this is the most rational, necessary action in all the world. Step two, Adonijah follows the strategy of gaining an echo. When you want something, not only do you find reasons, step two, you find someone to agree with you. Verse 7, then he conferred with Joab and Abiathar, and they followed and helped Adonijah. This is classic human nature. I want it. I convince myself it's great. So I go and find somebody, never a spiritual giant, right? I go and find somebody. You know, I really think, and you don't understand, I heard. And they go, yeah. And then I go, see? They agree with me. Every pastor knows what this is like when you have people and they come and they say, Pastor, a lot of people are saying. No, 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 wait, wait, stop. Not a lot of people are saying. You're talking to people, everyone you talk to. You say, it's not fair. They go, yeah, I guess. See? A lot of people. Because that's human nature. We gain an echo, we feel justified because we found some carnal, half-backslidden slob who agreed with us. And now gaining our echo, we move on. Step three, when you want something, we avoid a counter-opinion. Verse 10, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the mighty man, or... Solomon, his brother. So, we find the person we're certain will agree with us, but we do not ask people when we have an idea that they're not going to agree. I, I, people are that they have made the most insane decision. Like, uh, did you talk to anybody? Well, yeah, my cousin. Your cousin? <laughs> what? What about a man of God? What about, what about somebody who's saved? You know, that would, be, that would help. Because the problem is we don't want to risk finding anybody who will tell us we're wrong. You know, it's a dangerous thing in life to surround yourself with people who will agree with you at all times. I think I'm going to jump off a cliff. Good idea. Adolf Hitler lost the war, destroyed his nation. He destroyed millions and millions of people's lives because he did not have anyone in his life who could tell him no. I got a great idea. Let's attack Russia in the winter. No. That, that doesn't make sense. Let's talk about the second thought. Let's talk about after the challenge. What happens when you're wanting something without self-restraint and then you are challenged about it or you're caught out for doing wrong? What happens then? We would have to keep reading at the end of chapter 1 and on into chapter 2 of 1 Kings and we see what happens to a man who has no self-control when he's challenged or caught out. And what we see is Adonijah tries to preserve himself. 1 Kings 50, the 1, verse 50 and 51, Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. So he arose and went, took a hold of the horns of the altar. It was told Solomon saying, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. He's taken hold. He's grabbed the horns of the altar saying, let King Solomon swear to me today he will not put his servant to death with the sword. So 
Notice what Adonijah is saying. He is not saying, I was wrong. That is not what he's saying. You know what he's saying? Don't let there be any cost to my foolish, selfish, sinful decisions. Because this is often the problem with some men when they're challenged or when they're caught out. They don't want to face what they are. You know what their number one concern is? I don't want to be embarrassed. Wasn't this King Saul? Saul, the kingdom, you, you violated God. You're going to lose the kingdom. Okay, but look, on the platform, make sure that you, you honor me now, right? Because I don't want to be embarrassed. This is often what people do. They're caught out in sin. I don't want anyone to know. Is that the most important thing? Or, or I like this one. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll come back. I'll pray. But no one better ever say anything about it or I'm out of here. I don't want to lose my ministry. So you'd rather lose your marriage? You'd rather lose your family than be embarrassed or lose ministry? You'd rather send other people to hell than be embarrassed or lose ministry? You'd rather wind up in hell yourself than be embarrassed or lose ministry? Because that's Adonijah. Adonijah, okay, you caught me, but don't let there be any cost to this. This is often the difficulty with people who are caught out in sin and then they resent. It's like, man, my wife doesn't even trust me. That's because you cheated on her and treated her like dirt. There's a reason why. Like, man, it's been like two weeks and she still doesn't trust me. <laughs> I don't want cost. Second thing about an Adonijah is even after being caught out, he still tries to maneuver. You move on into chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. King David dies, and he comes to Solomon's mother, and he says, you know the kingdom was mine, that I should reign. But the kingdom has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Now I ask one petition of you, don't deny me. Please speak to King Solomon that he may give me Abishag, the Shunammite, as wife. So, I want to be king. No. Almost cost his life. So now, now he tries the back door. You know, you know that lady that King David had for a while? You know, the, the whole, these are one of those scriptures that hurt your head. Had the lady who laid with him just to keep him warm when he was old, you know. So, uh, I would really like to marry her. It wasn't just her beauty that was attracting him. He's trying to find another way if he has the king's woman. He's hoping that people will start to think of him as the king. So this is the problem. Adonijah didn't learn the lesson. Can I ask you a question? When you are rebuked, no. Do you learn the lesson or do you go back and do the exact same thing again? Can he learn the lesson? He almost died trying to grab the kingdom and now he is maneuvering to find another way to get the same thing. He's still trying to find a way to get his own way. This is the danger of reform without repentance. Repentance does not mean it's been three months, four days, and seven minutes since I last sinned. Success, no. 
That is not. Because you know what happens when you, your mind doesn't change? There are guys like, yeah, okay, all right, I did that. But it's been, it's been like a month since I did that. You know, but, you know, my wife, she is a witch, you know. No, your mind didn't change. That's right. Adonijah's rebuke, he almost dies, but then when he doesn't die, but his mind never changed. He still thinks the same about sin. And that is not repentance. Doesn't matter how many months, days, weeks, hours, minutes it's been, if your mind doesn't change, you're going to go down the same road again, just like Adonijah. In August of 2000, British sailor Eric Abbott had to be rescued by the British Coast Guard for the sixth time after he sailed off course and ran aground. Eric Abbott, think about this, he's getting into a boat, going out into the ocean. He admits he doesn't even know how to use a compass, which is the most basic navigation aid he doesn't even have any sea maps. He brought some road maps from the car to go into the ocean. Six times the Coast Guard had to rescue him when he got lost or ran aground or almost died. Okay, Eric, like after six times, are you going to stop doing that? No way. He says, I'm going to hit the water again soon. He says, uh, hit the water soon. I suppose the Coast Guard may be a bit fed up with me, but I never really mean to get into trouble. <laughs> I always like that when I'm challenging some of you, but I didn't mean it. In my line that I say, the difference between murder and manslaughter is intent, but in both cases, you still have a dead body. Listen, I didn't mean it. That doesn't, that doesn't make things right. So Adonijah, still trying to maneuver, not learning the lesson, he didn't repent. Let's talk finally about the options of life. So if we think about Adonijah, the problem in looking at his life is Adonijah destroyed himself. The first time he runs to the altar. This is like people, they get arrested, they get sick, there's a crisis. Oh man, you're in church. Wow. He's all, oh God, you got to help me. Don't let me die. So God had mercy on him. Solomon has mercy on him. But when you don't learn the lesson, he winds up and now he does that whole running to the altar thing. But 1 Kings 2.25, then King Solomon gave orders to Benaiah, and he went and killed Adonijah. This is the tragic and very real possibility of men who do not deal with the Adonijah that is inside of all of us. Is things get killed. They kill their finances. They kill relationships. They kill marriages. They kill ministries. They kill destiny. And you see the track record, athletes, coaches, politicians, executives, and sadly, disciples, Christians, pastors. If you don't deal with Adonijah, the very real possibility is you can destroy yourself. So it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. The Bible has stories that are a bummer. There's no happy ending with Adonijah. There's no teary Solomon. What was I thinking? And the music played and they ran toward each other. And <laughs> That's not how the story ends. It ends in death. But the Bible tells us these stories not to bum us out. It tells us stories so that we don't have to suffer the same fate. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6, these things happened 
as examples for us to stop us from wanting evil things as those people did. 1 Corinthians 10 talks about all of the failures and how they tested and tempted God in the desert. They lusted it for things they shouldn't have and on and on. And it says in all of those stories there was pain involved. But it says God recorded those stories of pain in other people so that we don't have to wind up like they did. So the question is, how do we avoid destruction? How do we make sure that the story of our life is not recorded? Everybody's life does some good, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it really suck if the purpose of your life is just to say to everybody else, don't be like this guy? <laughs> so how do we wind up making sure we're not destroyed. You know what we need? We need true repentance. The word repent, you, you've heard it a million times, metanoia. Meta is change, noia, the mind. To change your mind. Literally to see your sin like God sees it. I said before, Repentance is not, it's been three months since I last. That's not repentance. But you're still viewing it the same. Repentance is I change my mind. I'm not excused. It's not, well, yeah, I did it, but you don't know how they treated me. No, repentance isn't an excuse. I'm not misunderstood. I, I'm not deserving of what I did. I'm selfish. I'm foolish. I'm sinful. I was wrong. Repentance isn't just a turning from what we've done. It's a turning from what we are. Psalm 51 verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David is not saying, basically, I am a sensitive, wonderful man, but, well, yeah, I did that murder thing. No, he says, you know what? I am on the inside. That's the real issue. And When you see your sin like God sees it, you change your mind. Out of the change of mind will come the change of actions. But if you try the change of actions without the change of mind, it will never last. Second thing is we need self-discipline. I began the sermon by saying Adonijah had never heard the word no. That's, of course, from other people. That's his father's failure. But this isn't a parenting sermon. The real issue is Adonijah desperately needed to say no to himself. God help you if you need a life coach to be with you at all times. No. No. What we need is on the inside. We need to say no. I know there's a part of me that wants that but I will not. I say no. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, all those who compete in the games use self-control so they can win a, a crown. Self-control is a word that literally means strength over yourself. It means to contain or to restrain yourself. NIV says, so therefore... Those who want to go in the games, they practice strict training. The New Living Translation, they practice strict self-control. Self-discipline. Self-discipline is, first of all, it is a grace of God. It's something God gives you. It's a miracle. 
How can men who have never heard the word no, how can they suddenly, at whatever age you're at, how can you suddenly start saying no to yourself, to your own sinful nature? A miracle. Galatians 5, it gives the fruit of the Spirit something that the Holy Spirit gives or works in us. One fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is self-control. It's evidence of the Holy Spirit at work inside of us. This is why it's the cop-out. There, there are people, I, we were talking at breakfast this morning, I, I counsel people sometimes, and, and uh, if you're not careful as a pastor, you can let people depress you. Because they'll tell you, like, I tried everything. I fasted, I prayed, I tried everything. It, I just can't. Oh, the blood of Jesus works for billions of people. All the, But you're so unique. I can't. But the Holy Spirit can. It's a grace that God is willing. So what needs to happen if it's true that you can't ask God for a miracle? God, it's not in me. That's what David was praying, isn't it? When he said, create in me a clean heart. It's not in there. I need a miracle dimension. And the Holy Spirit will give the grace of self-control. But then there's the second part, and that flows out of human decisions. 1 Timothy 3.7 says exercise yourself unto godliness. That's a fascinating picture. You want to be God-like? The Bible says, exercise it. In the same way that if you want to get fit, if you're 300 pounds overweight running a marathon tomorrow, that's not going to work. Start small. Lifting a thousand pounds, that's not going to work. You start and you build up. Godliness is in the same way. You're not going to be a spiritual giant, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then you by tomorrow. One of the major mistakes that people make, men, they have good hearts, they're convicted, like, man, I've been a slug. I'm going to change. I'm going to read 50 chapters a day. I'm going to pray for seven hours. Every no, you're not. You know, how about, how about you just read a chapter? You know, why don't you, why don't you pray for a few minutes? Do that consistently. You can exercise, and that is how self-control it grows. Listen, every time you say no to your flesh, you strengthen the ability to say no more in the future. That's the spiritual discipline of fasting. Why would anyone go without food? You're saying no to your flesh. Self-control will determine your future. That's the true lesson from Adonijah. Lack of self-control will determine your future, but men, self-control really will determine your future. This is an absolutely critical dimension of discipleship. We were talking at breakfast this morning. What are the main factors? Inspiration is where it begins. Involvement in evangelism, working with people. But the Bible connects the ability to say no. Self-discipline and discipleship. 1 Timothy 3, five times in verse 3 alone gives us the word either not or no. A man must not be. In other words, he has to say no to booze, to violence, to greed, all kinds of things. 
If you have self-control as a disciple, you are saying, I'm, I am subjecting myself for a higher good. My flesh wants to do this or do that. I, I want to react, but I am going to say no. Why? Because I have a calling in God. One man said, oh God, help us to be masters of ourselves so that we may be the servants of others. Out of self-control, that's where our usefulness to God flows. If you can say no to yourself, you can be useful to God and to other people. Think about Joseph for a moment. Joseph is the opposite of Adonijah. Adonijah is seeking greatness. He's seeking self-will. But Joseph, he's the opposite. One of the profound things about Joseph's life is Joseph could say no. A woman comes and says, let's go to bed, and he says, no. Not only am I not going to go to bed, I don't even want to be in the same room with you. I'm out of here. Bitterness, his brothers violate him. If it was 2021, they'd make a movie how Joseph got revenge and killed all of his brothers one by one. <laughs> but he said, no, I'm going to let it go for the greater good. My calling, this is what God wants. Psalm 105, 21 and 22, Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler of all the king's possessions. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. A man who can say no to himself, God can use you. People will be blessed by your life. You, you notice I am not saying what we need is the absolute. We need the most brilliant minds in all of the world. I need people that you have incredible intelligent we want people of talent more than no we are some very ordinary men here you can be very ordinary if you can say no god has a future for you he'll bless your life yes and then it wouldn't be right if we're talking about self-discipline, we have to give hope for those who have failed to say no to themselves. Let's, let's be honest. You preach a sermon like this, there's some of you, right as I started point one, you said, I'm dead, <laughs> dead, doomed, it's too late. I want to give you hope. God does not give up on us. Listen, you, you might have a track record of failure. You might have a track record. You might not have had the word no in your vocabulary your whole life, but if you would repent tonight, God will meet with you again. God does not, the Bible says he doesn't despise the brokenhearted. Right? You know what that means in practical terms? That means when it's altar call time, and we go, it's me. God doesn't go, <laughs> they're coming to the altar again. He doesn't do that. If you're willing to repent, King David, he didn't say no to his flesh, winds up in sexual sin, commits murder. But when he repented, God worked with him again. He had further usefulness in God. This is the hope of the gospel. The gospel is this. God tells us what we are to be, not what you are right now. He tells us, listen, I, okay, right now, you don't have self-discipline. This is what you should be, what you can be, 
And then the gospel is he gives us the power to become what he wants us to be. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I close with this story. A man named Julio Diaz. In New York, he was on his way home from work, and a teenager ran up, pulled out a knife, and demanded that he hand over his wallet. Diaz gave his wallet to the boy. As the boy started running away, Diaz called out. He said, if you're going to be robbing people for the rest of the night, you might as well take my coat to keep you warm. And the boy stopped at his tracks, shocked. Diaz said, it's clear you need money. So he said, why don't you keep the wallet? Take my coat. You hungry? How about let's go get a bite to eat? The boy was too shocked to say no. He went along with him into the diner. <laughs> As they're eating in the diner, the, the boy is amazed at how waitresses and dishwashers are waving at Diaz. Everybody was friendly to him. He asked me, he's like, do you own this place? And he said, no, I don't own it. And he said, didn't anybody tell you? You got to be nice to people. He said, yeah, but I didn't think anybody actually acted like that. They continued to talk over dinner. When the bill came, Diaz said, uh, if you want me to pay, you're going to have to give me my wallet. <laughs> and the boy handed it over without a word. Diaz paid for the meal, gave the boy $20, and he says, you know, you probably should give me the knife too. And the boy did it. So here's, here's the point. Listen, listen. Now, when I started this story, some of you are going, you, you were waiting for, and so he jumped on and beat the snot out of him. Yeah! Yeah, he got what he deserved. Anyway, who would do that? You got my wallet? You need a coat too? You hungry? Apparently, Julio Diaz had self-control. And the point of that, because he had self-control, he wound up making impact on other people. Gentlemen, we don't have to be the brightest bulbs, the most talented, have perfect track records. If we can come with honest hearts and cry out, God, give me the ability to say no to myself. God can meet with us, and we then can be a part of his purposes and make impact on other people. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Thank God. I feel the presence of God here tonight. There are men, first of all, first order of business before we do anything else, there are men here, you are not saved. I don't know how you came, who invited you, but if you're honest, there are some of you, you're not right with God at all. It's not just like a little getting off track. You're, you know that God would not be pleased with the way you're living. Maybe it is. You've been making excuses. Like I said, I deserve, I've been hurt, on and on. But the fact is, you're not right with God. But I'm giving you hope because God will give you the power. The scripture I quoted, John 1, 12, as many as believed in him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. You can change your life, your destiny. If you will repent, God, the way I'm living is wrong in your eyes. I don't want to live that way anymore. And I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to pray. I need you to do a miracle inside of me. How many men here right now, you